How's your evening been so far? Oh, good, good. Yeah. Still got a few chores to do. Check cattle at night before we go to bed, so it's always mm-hmm. that case. It's an everyday thing. It's a lifestyle, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah. It's just start cabin. It gets to be a busy time of the year. Yeah, you guys are in Longview, aren't you? Right. Yeah. 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 That that place has grown and changed over time, hasn't it? Quite a little bit, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's about 300 people there now, I guess. No, that's been nice. When did you move to Longview, or had you always been in Longview? Well, my grandfather homesteaded the ranch I'm on in 1906, wow. and uh, I bought it from Uncle's Estate in 1975. So, okay. And before that, you were just in Calgary, eh? born and raised? Yeah, well, I had a, a small farm I rented in Strathmore. I moved from Strathmore to Longview. But I, I went to school in Calgary, yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Shore has changed here. <laughs> yeah. As we were talking earlier, the Calgary Herald building was the largest at the time. Yeah, well, it was two stories high, and I think the Palliser Hotel might have been a little bit taller than it. But uh, those were kind of the two tall buildings there at the time. If, if you think about it, I mean, our city is not old at all. And if all of that has come up in such a short period of time this is this is going to be interesting to see the next 50 years well that's for sure yeah Mm -hmm. now john i wanted to talk to you about how you got into what you do sure yeah well i uh i uh was going to school at crescent heights high school and uh went into a friend of mine called ronnie brock and uh, his dad trained racehorses so I started working with, with Ronnie and his dad, and we'd get up about 5 o'clock in the morning, go to the racetrack and work the horses, and then he'd drive us to school. And uh, through that, I made a lot of connections through, through the horse business. And then uh, a movie called uh, Little Big Man came up to uh, film here in about 1969, I guess it would be. And... Uh, they got hold of some of the guys at the racetrack to see if they get some riders, and they got hold of me. And I started on as a riding extra at $25 a day and thought, well, this is a lot of fun. And then I got moved up with the stunt guys, and I was getting 100 a day. I thought, well, boy, this is really the business. Mm-hmm. And uh, so at the end of the picture, they asked me to come to Hollywood and see what they did and learn the business because I was very interested in it. And uh, that's how it all kind of started. And I was down there for about three months and, Worked for nothing to get on different sets such as Gunsmoke, Ada Smith and Jones, and Big Valley and stuff like that. Wow! Home and I, uh, my grandfather had farmed with horses here in 1959, so I had a lot of his wagons and harness and that. And mm-hmm. I preserved all that and started putting an outfit together. And then, uh, consequently, it's ended up that I got one of the bigger outfits in Canada for a rental to the motion picture business. Before yourself being this icon in Alberta, who was in the industry or was Alberta known in the film industry or did this just happen over time? No, Alberta was not really known in the film industry. They did a picture with uh, Marilyn Monroe and Burr Lives. Oh, yes. Banff. In Kananaskis, yeah. Yeah, which was a, a pretty big thing at the time. And uh, then they'd... Uh, Done some bits and pieces. Eagle Lions did a picture called Thunderhead, mm-hmm. I think it was. Uh, and that was shot west of Longview. And that was about 1947, I guess it'd be. Okay. So, as I say, there was various bits and pieces. But Little Big Man was one of the <laughs> first big pictures to come here and kind of get the, uh, the film business uh, sort of going, I guess you'd say, or an interest in it. Yeah. Then after that, uh, 1972, we did a picture here, I guess it was with Paul Newman uh, called Buffalo Bill and the Indians. Oh, was that shot in Alberta? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was shot up at Morley. Morley yeah. And then uh, in 75, we had a picture called Mustang Country with uh, well, John Wayne's son, Ethan Wayne, and Robert Fuller and... Uh, Mm, Joel McRae. Wow. And uh, that's when we really started getting into it and getting things going. And uh, we just consistently uh, progressed from there. We did another show called Prime Cut with Lee Marvin and Gene Hackman. 
That's where I met Gene Hackman, and I became his stunt double for about three years and uh, worked with him quite a bit and went to a lot of different places. And uh, that's kind of really when the movie business started taking off was around the, the 80s, I guess. How was it to work with Gene Hackman? Oh, he was a prince of a guy and very professional. And uh, in those days, they didn't have monitors and stuff like that for the director to look through. But those guys were so professional, they just moved their feet two or three or four inches and they were right in front of the camera. It was much more different then. <laughs> oh, uh, very much more different then. And uh, there was hardly any, any walkie-talkies at those times. Well, a little big man. To start all the riders running, a bunch of guys would run out with green flags. And then when you wanted to cut, a bunch of guys would run out with red flags. So not so much has changed. <laughs> Time is short flown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, John, what was some of like your favorite projects that you've worked on? Or is there a favorite project? Oh, definitely. I think uh, Legends of the Fall was one of the, the best ones for me because I spent... Uh, four and a half uh, years with that director trying to convince him to come to Alberta. And I had a location friend of mine, Murray Ord, uh, who was a film mm -hmm. commissioner here in Calgary for a while. He spent about three and a half to four years on it as well. And uh, finally, when it came to fruition and we got her made, it turned out very well. Ah, okay. That makes sense. And the, the director, he spent seven and a half years trying to get it made. And uh, even the year before we got it going, it was going to be... Uh, Tom Cruise and Mel Gibson as the boys and uh, Sean Connery as the father. And then the studio shot us down again, saying that they didn't think Sean Connery was bankable. So uh, back to the drawing board, he brought in uh, Brad Pitt, Aidan Quinn, and Anthony Hopkins, and I brought in the native fellow, uh, Gordon Tatusis. Oh, yeah, okay. And uh, well, that's how we, we finally got her started. You've also worked with Tom Selleck. That must have been fun. Yeah. Tom Selleck shot a couple of pictures here on the ranch. One was uh, uh, Crossfire Trail, and the other one was Monty Walsh. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd, he'd been to Canada a few times, and his daughter comes up here quite a bit and jumps at Spruce Meadows. Oh, I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. Now, you also have Little House on the Prairie you guys have shot at the JS Ranch. Yeah, that was uh, that was like a remake of, okay. uh, of what it was, and uh, uh, we shot that here quite a bit and uh, all interesting pictures how tough is it to preserve some of the stuff that's been created on your ranch well if, if you don't use it fairly often it, it uh, the wind and the weather really uh, plays hell with the uh, with the town and some of the big buildings mm -hmm. so you got to be consistently patching roofs and, and putting stuff on and if uh the movies were going real good they you know you'd have one or two movies in in a year and they'd always do the upkeep on the buildings but uh it's uh it kind of goes in spells uh we've got another great western town site here uh called cl ranches belongs to the copperthorne family marshall Teresa copperthorne out uh just west of calgary here at springbank they've got 37 buildings on their place and it's a great western town where we've shot an awful lot, an awful lot of westerns there Okay. Where was Let Him Just Let Him Go filmed? Uh, Let Him Go was filmed, uh, oh, southeast of Calgary and uh, uh, in, in the general vicinity of uh, within 50 mile radius of Calgary. Yeah. Interesting. Now, John, when you when you think back at your life, some days are you like, did I make the right move? Or have you always said this is where I've always needed to be and love? Well, uh, I, I was very fortunate. I just uh, was kind of in the right place at the right time. And mm -hmm. then I had a lot of help uh, from a lot of people that helped uh, progress my career. And uh, many people like Gene Hackman and uh, Brad Pitt and those kind of people. And uh, of Lee, Lee Marvin, uh, they, they were such great help to me over the years. Have you met Clint Eastwood before? Yes, I, uh, I worked Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood. He was uh, fantastic to work with, and uh, uh, he he just came in. He, he was so smart about everything, and he came in under budget and ahead of schedule and everything else, and uh, uh, he was just amazing. And uh, like on Unforgiven, he was uh, 
a writer, a director, an actor, a producer, and his production company, Mal Paso Productions, was a, a producer, a production company on it. Have we seen more companies open up here in Alberta in terms of grip or lighting or whatnot, or has it have a lot closed down over the years? No. Uh, William F. White came in here, uh, mm-hmm. the Paul Bronfman and his family, and uh, came in here and set up a, a grip uh, house, an electrical house. And we did have another one owned by the Merrill's family called MTM, and those were the two. But now just this year, there's two more trying to move in here because they figure that uh, Calgary is going to be a, a, a good place to try and make pictures. And uh, what always, Peter Lougheed was just fantastic for our film business. Uh, we were the first province in Canada to create a, a, a film commissioner. And uh, when he got in, his, his wife liked the arts. Said, "Now, Peter, you got to do something for the arts." And he said, "I will." And 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 he did. And he created the film commissioner job to promote uh, films here to Alberta. And uh, he had two helicopters at his disposal, and he'd always give us one uh, helicopter to go scouting locations and show producers. Uh, the ideal locations, and that helped an awful lot. And uh, he uh, he really progressed the business. And then we had some different governments, and they kind of put the business backwards. And then tax credits came in across Canada, and uh, whoever had the best tax, tax credits is kind of where they went. And, now, John, what is the tax credits for the listeners? What does that mean? Well, a tax credit is uh, if you come to uh, Alberta, say, to shoot your movie, you can get a tax credit uh, on Alberta-based employment, the amount of people that you employ, and that tax credit can be from 26% to 30%. Oh, wow. And, and uh, so that was an attraction for uh, provincial governments to try and attract uh, another industry into their provinces. Well, BC uh, really took a hold of it, and uh, they really put the tax credit up very well and uh, promoted the business like you could not believe until the, the film business in BC is ahead of fishing, logging, and mining as an industry, and only behind tourism. And mm. when COVID was on, it was ahead of tourism. And they're doing something like five to six billion dollars a year, employing roughly 80,000 people a day in BC in different aspects of the film business. In uh, November of last year, they had 70 pictures shooting in British Columbia. And uh, they had such strict protocols with the COVID that I don't think hardly anybody got COVID. And how many did we have in Alberta last year? I think three. Oh, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of tells you this. We, we've been lobbying and lobbying the government to uh, get on side. And we didn't want a forever deal. You know, I said, just try us for two years. See what we can do for you. And uh, tell them that they have to uh, diversify. They can't put all their eggs in in one basket with oil and gas because it's just not working. And uh, there's nothing like the film business to diversify. A movie dollar has got a a spending value of six to one. In other words, it goes to the rental car agencies, the hotels, the restaurants, welding shops, lumber yards, uh, western stores, candy stores, flower shops, dry cleaners makeup places, things like that. We, we, we did a picture uh, with Liam Neeson in uh, Canmore, and I took his uh, makeup girl into uh, Calgary one day just to get some makeup. She spent $15,000 in makeup at this one store. Well, that was found money that that store had never had in that month. And this is just an example. I was running transportation on it, and uh, my fuel account was $70,000 a week on, on uh, that picture up there at uh, Canmore. So it speaks volumes. I mean, what are they not seeing? Or what do you see that they struggle to to make these decisions on? Cause... Well, I, I've heard every argument in the world. If we give money to the film business, we've got to give it to other businesses. Uh, we don't have it because we're trying to uh, compete with the health dollars and education dollars and things like that. And uh, But now... The fact is that uh, we've got about a 26% tax credit in Alberta here right now, which which is a good tax credit, but it's, it was capped at $7.5 million. They, They've now raised the cap to $10 million, so that, that helps us a lot. And uh, 
by doing that, we have the potential of uh, six pictures to come in here in the next six months. Now, that many pictures coming in here will employ roughly 4,000 people connected one way or another with the movie industry. Not necessarily all working on the set at one time, but uh, uh, the one big picture that's coming in is it's through home box office, and uh, it's going to go for a year. It's going to shoot for a year. And there, uh, we've got three or four other pictures like it in the uh, 20 to $40 million range. So this is very, very big business for Alberta right now. Mm -hmm. But it is also kind of depending on what happens with this budget coming down on Thursday if they put some money in there for the film business. And uh, I don't know that yet. I don't know if some people do know it yet or not. We're all hoping for that. But this is an opportunity for them to really put some people to work. And it can, can be a great crossover from people in the oil and gas business to come over to the film business. You know, an electrician is an electrician. Uh, an accountant is an accountant. A, a land man with oil and gas can be a location manager with film. And uh, things like that. You know, Alberta's got such a huge talent pool, especially with the trades. Very much so. Yeah. We've got uh, very hard-working crews here, and uh, uh, they're they're just known worldwide. And we've had a lot of the uh, uh, award-winning people, like uh, like the makeup girls, have won several awards on on different shows, and uh, the props people and the art department people have been nominated for uh, Oscars. Oh yes, things like that. So that's uh, great in itself, and we've got some very uh, well-known actors here. And uh, we've got the backdrop. We've got the scenery. There, there's no scenery that can compare to what we've got here in Alberta. No. Do you see that it is tough for the film industry in terms of getting people here and whatnot? Or is it literally the tax credit that's the biggest block? Uh the, the tax credit was a, a block. We were just on a level playing field with Winnipeg or Toronto or uh, Vancouver. And, uh, but as I say, it's getting better. And uh, I, I'd like to think that the government is trying. I just hope they put something in their budget for us for, to cover this group of pictures that want to come in here now. Because if they don't get a tax credit, they'll go someplace where there is a tax credit. Very simple. Winnipeg or... Uh, Winnipeg's got a fantastic tax credit, something like 40%. Wow. And uh, BC's got a, about 31%, another 7% if you shoot outside of Vancouver, and then another uh, percentage for doing your post-production in BC and uh, things like that. Because they realize the benefit of it to create jobs for people. It's huge. It's huge opportunities. And now more than ever, we need this. We, we need to get people to work and we need to get businesses open and going and, and things have got to get moving here again because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, people just can hardly barely survive. And it really aggravates me that the little mom and pop stores and that have been shut down and they're very careful with the COVID thing. And, but yet uh, you can go meet your relatives in aisle 33 at Costco or Walmart any day of the week. Yeah, it's just not fair. It's not fair. No. No, it's not fair. Do you believe that people are afraid of COVID? Is that what it is in the industry as well? Well, not so much in the film industry because they got very strict protocols. And mm -hmm. they put people into zones, A, B, C, and D, things like that. So if you're in the D zone, you cannot ride in a van that belongs to the A zone. And there's usually four COVID police officers on a set. And they make sure you're wearing your masks, you're washing your hands, you're keeping separation, things like that. The protocol has been very high, and that's part of the reason the American uh, pictures want to come up here and shoot is because our, our COVID thing is down. They shut Hollywood down there for a while, about three weeks ago. Couldn't shoot there because things were so hot. And that's part of the reason they want to come here. And plus, a lot of them are outdoor pictures where there's uh, pretty well social distancing anyways. John, what was one of your toughest moments in the film industry here in Alberta? Oh, man. Uh, just, Were there uh, some tough years? Were there some tough years? 
Oh, we had tough years. Yeah, like 1981, as a matter of fact. I think we only had one commercial here. <laughs> That's That was oh, all God. the business we had then, just one yeah. commercial. And, uh, and then it started to pick up after that. But, no, we had some very slow years. But then we got rolling, and we had like about six or seven crews here at one time. And uh, we were doing real big pictures, and uh, you know, such as Jackie Chan's Shanghai Noon, and uh, such as that. Uh, we had exit uh, wounds during that time. Oh yeah, it was early yeah. early two thousands, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, exit wounds was a big one that came here, and uh, and we were rolling, and then uh, things just started to fall apart. BC started to take over the business. A lot of our crews left here and went to BC because they couldn't make a living here. And uh, it was really bothersome to me that we were training young film students in uh, Nate and Sate and Mount Royal and the university. And they come out, they couldn't get a job here, so they went right to Vancouver. And, and a lot of them have never come back. Oh, and I, I hope we can bring them back, and I hope Alberta's government can really understand that, hey, this is a, a huge opportunity in and like I said, what better time than now? There's no better time than now. And, and uh, the amount of people we can put to work here in the next six months is just going to be out of this world. And it's going to be great for uh, getting the money flowing back in the, in the area. And uh, Alberta's got such great scenery. Uh, when we did the Revenant and took the director around, he says, oh, this is the place. This is perfect. This is what I want. But the producers would say, all right, we got to find that in BC because the tax credit in BC was bigger. They had seven to 10 location people in BC trying to find what we had in Alberta and they couldn't do it. And so they had to bite the bullet and stay here, even though it was a less of a tax credit. And, but then when you get things going, like uh, they're trying to put open pit coal mining down here uh, in southwestern Alberta and, and knock a whole mountaintop off and, uh, just decimate it uh why do they want to do that why not preserve our scenery and the things that we make for the sake of 300 jobs that's going to ruin the water when downstream in lethbridge the mayor of lethbridge has got a deal going right now to provide 2500 jobs as, as long as he's got good clean water to offer and, and one's for a distillery and two's for french fry uh, french fry factories so hmm. The, the coal thing is a very sore point with a lot of people around here. Yeah, it didn't sit well. I, didn't, I was very upset about it. It was, it was disappointing to see our government from its leadership go that route, despite now the outcome of what they've said and whatnot, just the thought of them thinking it was okay to do so. Well, definitely without consulting anybody. Mm -hmm. But don't kid yourself. I don't think this thing's over with yet. I think they're still... Still courting that rich woman out of uh, Reinhardt's, her name, out of Australia. And, and the, the government was going to get really nothing out of it. They canceled 11 coal permits there, thinking that it, it's all smoke and mirrors. Those 11 permits only came to $66,000. It's nothing for this government. And this government was going to get 300 jobs and 1% royalty out of the coal deal down here in Grassy Mountain. In Australia, they pay a 7 to 8% royalty. But it, it, <laughs> who made that deal? <laughs> well, it kind of started, I think, with a bit with NDP, but uh, Jason kind of has kind of carried it through. Yeah, and it it went underneath their nose, and it wasn't brought up. They uh, they tried to release it all on uh, May twenty fourth weekend on a Friday night last year, when they thought everybody's way and gone to the mountains, <laughs> but they got caught. Yeah, it was a little trickster of them. Because what was it, 1976 or 73, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, Peter Law, he'd put the coal policy in. They have no open mining, uh, coal mining going on. And in a way, he was ahead of his time. But he was trying to preserve the beauty of Alberta. Have you been worried with all the construction and whatnot that our history is going away and the heritage is fading? Definitely, definitely, definitely. That's how I got into this business, because when we did Little Big Man, it uh, they came here to get the winter scenes. And it was December the 10th. We were down on the river, on the Bow River, and it was 80 above Fahrenheit. A Chinook had come in and taken all the snow away and everything else. And all the wranglers and stunt guys were in their shirt sleeves. It was so warm. And they said, look at the beauty of this place. And 
this is where they're going to start and make the next Westerns because there's no power poles, there's no power lines, there's no telephone lines, there's no skyscrapers, there's no this, there's no that. And I took that all in, and that was what I, I could see as a potential for Alberta in, in the future. And sure enough, it was true. Well, now we've got all those things. We've got towers, and we've got lines here, there, and everywhere, and we keep losing less locations all the time. We lose more locations, I mean, all the time. So there's less places for them to shoot, and then there's more rules when they go to shoot. When we go to shoot in the Cananascus now, and we want to do a car chase in there, you can't bring the helicopter down below, I think, 1,500 feet. Well, that doesn't work very well. So a lot of things against us. Now, what is really going to try and kill us right now is Trudeau bringing in this uh, gun law for uh, no handguns. Well, every Western has got the Colt 45s and the pistols and the detective pictures have all got handguns and everything like that. So now the props people, they're, they're just doing backflips trying to figure out how are we going to operate this year. Wow, because they use real handguns, just blanks, right? That's right. They use blanks, and uh, and a lot of them are replicas, but they're replicas of a real handgun. But I, I don't know the exact rules, so I, I shouldn't say, but I don't think you're allowed to have the replicas neither. So um, It's going to be challenging. There's one thing after another. I see that, yeah. Yeah, so it's just mm -hmm. you keep getting more rules and more things uh, every year that affects different businesses. And whether it's agriculture, whether it's logging, or whether it's the film business, uh, there's some bureaucrat wants to make a, a dollar off uh, verifying his job. Now, on your uh, on, sorry, I have a little puppy here that just randomly likes to bark. What what kind of dog you got? He's a, a French bulldog. Oh, really? Is that right? Yeah, he'll be a character. Oh, yes, he is. Yeah. I don't know if he's hardly a dog or what, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Depends who you ask, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you have any uh, dogs? Yeah, I've got an Australian Shepherd. Oh, that's a dog. Too. And then I've got some people at work here, and they got got uh, Border Collies. Okay. Yeah. yeah, You need those out there. Yeah, they work the cattle quite a bit. And, uh, Are you ranching the cattle as well yeah. as a side? Uh, okay. Yeah, we, we run a working cow ranch here. It's a cow-calf operation, and we run a uh, buffalo herd as well and uh, mm -hmm. keep about 100 head of horses for the motion picture business. I was watching a video uh, that you have on YouTube, and 10 years ago, you guys used to have longhorn. Yeah, yeah, we did have a big longhorn herd here. Uh, we don't we don't have them anymore right now, but uh, we still have access to them. When you look at your ranch, if your grandpa or your mom and dad were around, what would they be thinking, John? Oh, <laughs> my grandfather, he couldn't believe it. I don't think the amount of kind of famous people that have been through here. And uh, he used to leave here with a team and wagon at four or five in the morning oh, to go into nice. High River. With a load of grain, yeah. and he sell a load of grain, then back, bring back lumber to to build around the place. That took him all day long, and I mean, I can whip into High River now in twenty five minutes. Mm -hmm. He never was on an airplane in his life, and one week I was on seven different airlines. It's just so strange, and the and having combines and tractors now that run without people doing it thing, you know with the gps stuff and that is just i don't think he ever ever would have imagined it because he was from the old school he worked with horses till quite a bit later than other people did other people had lots of tractors or had tractors and and he didn't he did it all with the team and that's what helped me in the business is i learned from him how to work this stuff with teams of horses and uh, that's what we use so much in the western pictures he must have been a very tough man like Tough, strong. rough skin, you know, like that strong but, mentality. But it came from the Orkney Islands, which is a, a little area off of Scotland. He and his uh, mm -hmm. two brothers. And uh, they, they had a lot of hardships here when they homesteaded. And the women, the women in those days just worked so hard and, uh, and didn't have mm -hmm. much. And uh, for the way of life, what, what people got now is just astronomical. Uh, they don't understand the hardships that those pioneers went through. No, and we have to, that's why it's so important to preserve and uh, 
remember and respect it all. This is fading, and it does worry me at times, especially Alberta's heritage. Yes, very much so. We've got such a rich heritage with uh, so many, uh, I guess you'd call them characters, you know, people like John Ware and uh, Pat Burns and uh, uh, Crosses and, uh, and all those families, those early day families that put their roots in here and made things happen, left a legacy for the next generation. Was your mom and dad around when you had taken over the ranch? Yeah, yeah. My mother yeah. just passed away here two years ago. She just missed her hundredth birthday by about twenty days. So she was uh, she was amazed at everything that uh, changed. And I asked her, "What's some of the biggest things that?" <laughs> she says, "Well, fire escapes was one. Escalators was another. Velcro was another. <laughs> 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 so like that that we don't we don't even think about it. <laughs> so." Uh, yeah, and, and what were some of the like lessons that you learned from Grandpa that you apply in your everyday life? Well, watch nature. If if you watch what nature's doing, they'll give you a clue what's going to happen. And uh, mm-hmm. if you abuse nature, you go against nature. You usually be working uphill. In, in the tough times, have you wanted to throw the cloth in and say, "I can't do this anymore"? Oh yeah, but I pretty lucky i uh i had some pretty good bankers that uh, kept me going and uh and believed in what i was doing i guess and i worked a lot with the treasury branch and uh, they've been very very helpful and very supportive of the film business they've helped the film business a lot of different ways and helped our community as well they uh we put on uh we got a, a rodeo grounds here just north of longview and they've helped support that and uh things like that that uh yeah They've been great. What is um, currently going on? Do we have a commissioner here in Alberta? Yes, we, we do have a film commissioner. And we got uh, uh, one here that uh, works out of Calgary, basically covers most of Alberta. Uh, Luke Azevedo is his name, and he works with Calgary Economic Development. And Calgary okay. Economic Development has been very much behind film and helped, uh, you know, no end to uh, lobby the provincial government to... Uh, open doors and, and, and make things happen. And uh, you need somebody in government to be responsible to somebody in government to help our business. Mm-hmm. In the next 50 years, where do you see this film? Or in the next 10 years, let's say that. Well, it's going to be tough because if things keep happening to them, such as this handgun law that came in, last week or whatever it was or uh there's more uh people moving to canada and to alberta and calgary area and that that they take up more space that takes away uh scenery and things like that and uh i find that you know big wide open spaces you've almost kind of got to go to the big ranches in the foothills to do western pictures or outdoor pictures or you have to uh, go to the native reserves, the, the, uh, the, the indigenous reserves, to find good water and, and scenery and things like that. So that's uh, going to, locations is going to be a, a hard thing in the, in the future. And rules, when they keep putting in all these rules, you know, when I first started, we did an awful lot of work with helicopters. And you'd fly a helicopter 10 feet above two guys in a canoe down a river and the guy'd be flying sideways through the following the river and just 10 feet above the guys in the canoe. Well, now the department of transport's got all these rules. You got to be so many feet in the air and this and that. Then your cameras don't get what you really want to get. But now on the other hand, we've got new things coming out like drones. Who would ever imagine mm-hmm. drones could take away uh, a lot of the work of the helicopters. So, Things are changing, and uh, I'm kind of from the old school. I'm not uh, really up with the changes, but uh, uh, it's happening. Did you get a chance to meet uh, Jackie Chan? Oh, yeah. Jackie Chan was wonderful. Just uh, the hardest working actor, I think, out of a lot of them. A lot of them worked very hard. Brad Pitt worked hard, and Morgan Freeman worked hard. But uh, uh, Jackie Chan really put a lot of effort into it. But he was so gracious. We had a crew of about 200. So every Saturday night, he'd take 50 of the crew out for Chinese food until he worked through the whole crew. And then he'd start and go through them again. 
Oh wow, that's really awesome! Oh, uh, to, well, that, yeah. you know, it's a pretty expensive thing to do, and uh, uh, but it really kept up the spirits and things like that. And uh, he was great. Was he as funny as he is in his pictures and entertaining? Yeah, yeah, he was. He was funny. He uh, he, he wasn't quite as funny as the guy I worked with called Robin Williams. And Robin Williams was so quick and so sharp-minded, and just unbelievable and such a gracious man as well you know it was uh he'd bring some of these special needs kids to the to the set to see what he did and what was happening give them t-shirts caps anything you could think of and then he'd say and say the next one john do you think i did enough for those kids what else could i have done and uh he was just tremendous he spoke he went too oh, soon very much so yeah and spoke seven how, how did he <laughs> He spoke seven languages fluently. Wow. But he had yeah. a very sharp mind. Yeah. I heard he was uh, he's also very quiet, wasn't he? He could be quiet at, at times. But uh, see, when I did the first night at the museum with him, and I'd done, I'd done another show with him called RV, but uh, he was quite, I guess I'd say, boisterous. But then I think his health was failing a bit when we did uh, Night at the Museum 2, I guess it was. And uh, he wasn't quite the same guy. Do, do a lot of them remember you, John, when to meet him again? When they come yeah. Back? Oh, yeah. Like Aiden Quinn, he came here and he said, well, I, I want to meet John Scott the day I get off the plane. Oh, and that was great. Awesome. I mean, we're very good friends and... Uh, I was quite good friends with Brad Pitt. And, uh, of course, Gene Hackman was very supportive of everything that I tried to do or, or that and promoted my name quite a bit in Hollywood. And uh, Lee Marvin was that way, too. He, uh, I met him on Prime Cut, and then I did another show with him called Death Hunt, him and uh, Charlie Bronson. And uh, I had a hard He was a great oh, yeah. actor, yeah. I had a hard time getting on that picture. I think I'd rubbed a producer the wrong way or something, and uh, they were trying to keep me off it. And, and Lee Marvin just says, and when it comes to the horses, we're going to have John Scott here, and he's going to work the horses. <laughs> they, they couldn't turn me down. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. No choice. <laughs> yeah. uh, so so grateful to him for that. Yeah, John, there was a, a movie in Calgary, uh, It Takes Two, Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. Uh, oh, the Olsen twins. Yes, they did yeah, a movie here. They, did. I think in, they were at a there ranch. There was a ra- Raptor Six ranch. ranch. Yes, the there we go. Raptor Six Ranch is where they shot that. And, uh, is that still around? Uh, to a point. It, uh, it kind of went into receivership, and then it got sold, and then a lot of the stuff got torn down. And uh, a couple from Banff bought the place, and... Uh, They've put up some new buildings. It's quite nice. It, it's just called, uh, it's not called Rafter 6. It's just called 6, I think. Yeah. Six. Okay. Now, John, if somebody wants to, or the young people for the future, what do you hope that they can do for the, the film industry? And most importantly, how can they help preserve the culture and history and heritage of Alberta? Well, uh we're trying a lot of different things. We're going to put on a, a native uh, stunt school here pretty quick for uh, for native kids and indigenous kids to try and learn the business and, and get involved. There's some very, very sharp natives that uh, uh, have got a lot of talent, and uh, the world is opening up for them and, and ethnics and, and other people like that. And uh, so we're going to see how the stunt school is going to work, and that's – be one of the things we're going to teach them, but you know, uh, is nature and get back to your ways, Pre- preserve your heritage, keep your hair long, things like that. Uh, you know, like on Revenant, I had to have 40 riders that were very slim built and all long hair because they didn't have enough time to be putting wigs on them. And, and I did turn up with them and they, they were a great bunch of guys came to work on time and they did not drink. And, uh, that was a big deal. Nobody could believe that I could put mm-hmm. that many uh, good native riders together just like that. If anyone can do it, John Scott well, I won't can do say it. That, but, uh, <laughs> I know a lot of people <laughs> that can help me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
What has been equivalent to your success, John, over the years? Has it been people? I, I think it's basically people. I always tried to hire people that uh, were, uh, you know, outgoing and, and, and happy and positive. Positive, that's the word I'm looking for. I always tried to hire positive people because they, uh, they'd always keep things upbeat. And, and if there was a challenge, well, they'd, they'd rise to the occasion to help make it work. If you got negative people around you, they will drag you down. They'll drag the project down. But uh, that, that's been the big thing is the people. And uh, I had a lot of great friends through the rodeo business. You know, the Glass family were all chuck wagon champions, and they covered the yes. team. Well, I'll give you an example. When did Paul, uh, Paul Newman's picture, Buffalo Bill and the Indians, the caliber of Wranglers I had one weekend that went to a rodeo, Tom Buse won the bronc riding. Uh, Tom Glass won the chuck wagon racing. His brother-in-law, Richard Cosgrave, was second. Isabel Miller won the barrel racing. Uh, uh, one of the deuces uh, was doing the trick riding, and uh, John Dodds won the bull riding, and that was that was the caliber uh, of people we had. But those people were all Canadian champions in the rodeo world, oh, yes. and that's what also helped start the film business here was was the rodeo community. I don't think anywhere in the world you'll find a community like no. we have here. So and and we've got so many other great venues here, such as Spruce Meadows. You know, they're they're fantastic, and and they were very helpful to the film business and and what they have created and the legacy that Ron and uh, and his family are leaving is unbelievable. Heritage Park has been very helpful to the film business as well, and uh, we've had some great people running Heritage Park and. Uh, Ron Carey had such a collection. He created Gasoline Alley oh, yes. and, uh, and and did so much. And uh, we did a picture with Sam Elliott called You Know My Name. And uh, Ron came with a whole bunch of old trucks and old vehicles and that. And that really uh, helped make that picture. Do we have a company here in Alberta that does or carries all the old vehicles? Uh, the there's, there's bits and pieces here and there. Not not quite like mm. the collection that, that Ron had at, at one time. Well, of course, he got a lot of his collection at Heritage Park, and there's a bit left there at j &L Supply. But uh, nobody that's really uh, got that going anymore the way it is. As I say, there's bits and pieces. You've got the collection out there at Iracana, which Ron Carey started. And uh, Stan Reynolds' deal in Wetaskiwin is gone, and uh, the... Mm fellow called Evans and Lethbridge his deal's gone and so this stuff just kind of disappears and filters into private collectors but instead of having a collection of 30 old time trucks and that it's down to maybe two or three with different people mm -hmm. now I bet you some of your wagons and some of the props and outfits of the things that you have yeah. once they're gone they're gone so it's like how do you protect and preserve those important things, especially stuff from well, your grandpa. That, that's it, exactly. I mean, uh, I've got one of the largest wagon collections for rental to the movie business that there is in uh, in Western Canada. I've got about 100 wagons and buggies. But uh, there's other museums that have got, the Remington Museum has got as much, maybe more. And uh, But they don't really rent out to the motion picture business, although when they hit hard times, they started to. Uh, Brett Wilson has got quite a collection. And uh, certain people like that. So there's some around. But when I've got a friend in California, and he collects old wagons and buggies like I do, but he also collects old cars. He says when the young kids come in, he says they don't even look at the wagons and the buggies. They just all go right to the cars. He says the interest the is see. not there anymore. And, and you don't have the young mm. people starting up and driving teams for uh for pleasure anymore you do with the chuck wagon business that's kind of handed down generation to generation but you know that's kind of in trouble right now too you know calgary's not uh, treating them real well and uh i don't know what's going on we don't have chuck wagon racing this year it could be the end of it have you do you have like a prize wagon or a prize something like from your grandpa that you always adore and love and look at and say, it reminds yeah. me of his work at the Yeah, no, I've got an old wagon there that uh, I used to uh, drive with him as, as a kid. There was an old grain wagon. I had it pretty well fully restored because the wheels were getting rotten. It, that mm -hmm. thing is, uh, well, it's over 100 years old now. I mean, 
1906 to, to now. It's 120, 115 years old. So, yeah, there's bits and pieces. Some of his harnesses here, and just some little things that, uh, that he made. He was kind of a blacksmith, and he made a lot of uh, iron stuff around the place. And uh, that's all been preserved, of course. That's, that's lasted. No, the barn still exists. He built the barn in uh, 1906. And uh, I put a new foundation under it and put a new floor in the loft, but it's still the same barn and it's still as sturdy as ever. You know, so many of our grain elevators oh, are going, yeah. which also <laughs> makes me worried. And it's sad so to see many that happen. Gone. Man, there's hardly, <laughs> probably maybe only 20 or 30 left in Alberta when there used to be 300. Mm -hmm. Kind of worrisome. It's almost like we've got to find a way to protect yeah. those as well. Yeah, so. yeah. But the thing is, with this younger generation and their uh, their texting and their computer stuff and that, they don't seem to be interested in uh, in nature or uh, the world worldliness of life to really enjoy what is around them. There, there's a few exceptions, but mm -hmm. I've I've seen kids sitting across the table from each other and instead of talking to each other, they're texting to each other. They're losing their social skills. Yeah, I mean, if they could just go out and just see what's out there without their phones, it might be nice once <laughs> yeah, in a while. Would... <laughs> yeah, in the most yeah. polite way. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, That's funny. You know, I just, I just don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Kids are going to have to really get an education, I think, these days in order to stay ahead of the curve, or they're going to be they're going to be a minority working for feudal lords, <laughs> I guess you might say. Oh, Big yes. Purple. Oh, yes. John, is there a way for us to protect the history? Is there something in Alberta we could do? Because there's museums and all this, but there's only so much they can do. And like you said, this year specifically, or this last past year, they oh, got yeah. rocked yeah, they, quite hard. They didn't get the uh, the help from the government because the government didn't have the help to give them. And, of course, they were closed because of COVID and things like that. So they didn't have the income. And so a lot of them are really hurting. And uh, I, I just... You know, Heritage Park, when they didn't have their steam uh, boat going or their paddle wheeler boat going, you know, they lost a lot of revenue. And it's things like that that hit them. And you just have to hope that influential people leave part of their wills or their estates to, to keep some of these going because it is very important. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh... I mean, you drive down some areas and you just see all the old vehicles and I kind of want to just put them on a trailer <laughs> like they're out in the, the farmlands. And you're like, man, I just would rather preserve all these old vehicles. Like some of them are, need to go, yeah. but some could stay like the yeah. old, old tow yeah. trucks. And, you know, it's just really yeah, cool. Like to I see. say, that collection of Ron Carey's was out of this world. And he had more of those old style gasoline pumps than anybody in North America. A lot of them are at Heritage Park. It's interesting to see how what people collect oh, yeah, in life, isn't for sure. it? Yeah. yeah, some of the oddball stuff. What is it? Tom, What's Tom one of your collections? Typewriters. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I would have never guessed. So, uh, well, I collected what old you collect? for quite a while because I could use them in the business, and uh, and I, you know, I got an awful lot of them, and uh, we're. The stuff had a lot of value at one time when I was getting started and going and, and preserving that stuff, and but now it's gone down uh, by thirty percent at least. It's almost like yeah, the stamp yeah. business, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Stamps were valuable, or I think they are still. Yeah, stamps. yeah. There was stamp collecting was pretty big when I was when I was young, but it's uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of different. But now you're a buggy yeah, collector. I've, I've, I was collecting buggies and wagons for a long time, and uh, I've kind of mm -hmm. reached my limit right now. Unless it's something very unusual, I don't uh, really bother with it anymore. But at a time when we were putting them together, I was buying them in California, I was buying them in uh, Montreal, all over the place, wherever I could to put a collection together. Mm -hmm. so that, yeah, you know we have Alberta rolling yes. here now. 
Yeah, okay, okay. Rolling in Keep Alberta. Alberta. What else do we have? A young fellow called Brock Scretty. Keep Alberta. Brock Scretty and uh, some of his partners uh, have done this. and They've done an excellent job. And it's basically been all on their own dime. They have not had much help. Had a little bit of help from some union uh, donations, I should say. But uh, he's really gone out and uh, and promoted Alberta and done a fantastic job with the uh, small towns all around Alberta and, and telling them the benefit that they can have from a motion picture being shot there. And I'll give you an example on uh, here in Longview. I got the gas account for Unforgiven at the Little Esso service station. And he said it was like having another summer, mm-hmm. the amount of volume he took in from the gas account there see that yeah. says something <laughs> and uh drum heller has benefited an awful lot from uh the motion picture business and, and they've helped very much in return and uh and, and they enjoy they realize the, the value of a movie dollar coming there of course do we have a museum like is your place a museum not the really it, uh, yeah it's got a lot of old stuff there here including myself but it's uh mm-hmm. it's it's not really a museum but i i should try and make part yes. of it into a museum and preserve some of the stuff i guess uh, mm-hmm. john one day i would love definitely to come definitely you got an there. open invitation <laughs> just tell me the yeah. day, day in you. advance and uh, thank you john. we got three movie sets here yes. on the ranch and uh and we have shot a fair amount of stuff here, but we uh, do have a collection of props, an awful mm-hmm. lot of vintage props. To uh, yeah, we t- I try to make it one-stop shopping center for uh, a Western producer to make a Western picture. Mm. Okay. And that has that shifted a lot for you lately? Like, well, despite all this, has it been challenging as well? To make Western movies, well, it goes in spells, it and, and sometimes you'll get a whole bunch going, and, and then all of a sudden it'll die out for maybe seven years. And uh, we've had Heartland going for the, this; going to be the fifteenth year that Heartland goes. I've got the bulk of the horses on that, mm-hmm. but uh, so that's been unbelievable, really, that it would go that long. And uh, but oh, yeah. one one of the actors just like, yeah left he, he did the uh, show. Graham Thank Wardell he. he uh, he played Amber's husband, <clears throat> and he he just kind of had enough mm-hmm. and felt he was getting typecast, and that's usually what happens. I mean, you know, when they spend fourteen or thirteen years on a on a project, they kind of get taken off the market, and then people think, well, that's all you can do. So, if they want to rise their career, they kind of got to move around a bit and do something different. Exactly. Yeah, everyone's sure got a time, like don't it. they? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Now, John, before I let you go here, what's one of the best pieces of advice you've got and you could pass on to people? Don't do anything that would embarrass your mother. Hey, thank yeah. you very well, thanks much. Thanks so much Appreciate again, your John. Time. And if you need anything else, give me a holler, but be sure and come out and bring the girlfriend out and bring Deb out and we'll uh, give you a tour. And, uh, then we'll see if we can get work dinner in. So let me know if, and if you let me know a bit in advance, mm-hmm. then I'll take you to the Longview Steakhouse. And that's kind of a good spot around here. It was rated 15th in the world as yeah. a steakhouse, but we just got to get a reservation a bit in advance. Oh, 